had a good trip to the UK, huh? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Toured London, Cambridge, Birmingham on yeah. a, a national book tour of the United Kingdom. Right. I'm touring the United States right now. All right. Very good. Well, it's a heck of a book I've had a chance to look at. Bear with my ignorance. We're going to be learning and welcome very much to uh, Conversations where it's a real pri uh, honor and privilege to welcome to the program Michio Kaku, Dr. Michio Kaku. He's got a new book out. We've talked with him in the past, and he's familiar to... Um, you're on, you're on BAI, you have a regular program That's on right. science. A weekly so national radio show. National radio mm -hmm. show. But he's got a new book out. It's just out January this year, and it's called Parallel Worlds. And we're going to be talking about this book and other matters of, of considerable cosmic import, as mm -hmm. it were. And it's a great pleasure to welcome him to the program, and welcome very much, Michio. It's good to see you again. Well, glad to be on the show, really. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> I wonder if you could, we want to talk about the book, but I wonder maybe you could share some of your own, a little of your own background, if you could. And I know you've written other books, Hyperspace, we've talked mm -hmm. to you on that, and you had visions, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's and right. And you have this radio, national radio program that brings science into the consciousness of a great number of people, for which I thank you and the world thanks you. Mm -hmm. But oh. could you share a little of your own background? Well, you know, I, I grew up in California, right. and uh, we lived, of course, under the, the fear of the nuclear age, mm. uh, nuclear testing. Mm. However, you know, for me, that was fascinating. Yeah. I wanted to know more about this. Yeah. And when I was a child of eight, uh, Einstein had just died, uh. and it was in all the newspapers that a giant of science had just died. But on that very same day, they flashed a picture of his desk in all the national media. Yes. And the caption was, unfinished work of the greatest unfinished project. <laughs> and I said to myself, what could be so great yeah. that Einstein could not finish it? Yeah. Well, it was a lifelong endeavor, but I found that it was the unified field theory. Right. The theory of everything. Right. The theory that was going to unite gravity, and the nuclear force, and all the forces of the world, so that we could read the mind of God. Uh -huh. That was was the dream. And today we think we have it. Today we think we actually have the theory. Uh -huh. And the theory is far beyond anything what Einstein conceived of. Uh -huh. uh, it's a theory of parallel worlds. Mm -hmm. It's a theory of other dimensions. It's uh -huh. a theory that's rocking the foundations of modern science. Uh -huh. So I got started onto it when I was a child. You were just a child. Yeah, l answering that question that he had addressed. Unified field theory? That's right. And, that was but and yours is coming out of uh, quantum mechanics? And is there a difference? And is there a different approach to things? And does it matter? It matters. Uh -huh. You see, Einstein gave us a picture yeah. that the universe is some kind of soap bubble, uh -huh. and the soap bubble is expanding and slowing down, mm -hmm. and the soap bubble is made out of atoms. Okay, mm -hmm. so you got that. Mm -hmm. An expanding universe, we mm -hmm. live on the skin of this soap bubble, like, like flies trapped on flypaper, yeah. and the bubble is made out of atoms and is slowing down. Mm -hmm. Now we realize that everything I just said mm -hmm is wrong. Wow. Okay. The yeah. old picture of Einstein worked very well when we had old instruments like telescopes. Mm -hmm. Now we have satellites. Don't we ever. And because of satellites, we have what is called the WMAP satellite currently orbiting the Earth, which has given us a revolutionary new picture of the universe. Yeah. First of all, the bubble is not really made out of atoms. Uh -huh. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh -huh. It's made out of dark matter and uh -huh. dark energy. Uh -huh. The bubble is not slowing down, it's speeding up. Uh -huh. It's accelerating out of control. Uh -huh. And the thing that I wrote about in the book Parallel Worlds is that there could be other bubbles. Mm -hmm. Now, in slide number one, mm -hmm. where we have a picture of my book. Yeah, maybe we can try and bring it up if we can, yeah. Yeah, okay, if you look uh -huh. carefully on, on slide number one, you see that there's really a, a multiverse. Uh, uh -huh. Universes coexisting with other universes, uh -huh. bubble universes, mm -hmm. each with their own galaxies mm -hmm. and their own expanding universe. Yeah, we can see that now. That's the slide number one. You can see it on the monitor now. Right, right look carefully yeah. in that picture. Yeah. You see that each bubble has its own set of galaxies, uh -huh. its own set of nebulas and stars. And we believe in a multiverse of universes now. We believe that our universe, even before the Big Bang, uh -huh. coexisted with other soap bubbles, mm -hmm. other bubbles expanding. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is very pleasing because, well, my parents are Buddhists, yes. but I was brought up in a Christian tradition mm -hmm. where we have Genesis. In, yeah. Buddhist, uh, in Buddhism, of course, there's no beginning, there's no end. Yeah. There's just timelessness. Right. And now we have... Steady in, state? Is that well, we have a beautiful melding of the two ideas yeah. now. Uh -huh. We have... Uh, Genesis constantly taking place in a nirvana of higher dimensional hyperspace. Okay. 
Okay, okay, that involves quite a little bit in there and that sort of thing. And you, you, you spoke before about uh, you, we have these telescopes, we have these satellites now, and there's one Wilkinson something? Wilkinson uh, microwave and isopy uh, probe. Um, in the last era, we had giant telescopes like at Mount Wilson, 100-inch right. telescopes. Oh, that right. gave us the picture of the soap bubble that was expanding, a yeah. dynamic universe. Our universe. Our universe as a, a soap bubble of some sort expanding. However, now the WMAP satellite mm -hmm. is orbiting the Earth right now. Mm -hmm. It's giving us baby pictures of the Big Bang itself, yeah. believe it or not. Baby you pictures had, of the instant of creation. You had a, you had a picture in the, in the, uh, in the book of the, you know, the, the, the Big Bang we now know is 13.7 billion years. That's yeah, we know that number to within 1% accuracy. Isn't that 13. something? 13.7%. And it's the satellites that made us a able to measure with such accuracy That's right. now. Satellites and have changed everything. You know. Einstein could only, of course, dream of having satellites vindicate his theories. Mm. But now we can calculate the age of the universe to within 1% accuracy Isn't that with the WMAP satellite. And you had a photograph of the universe only 370,000 years before the Big Bang. After the Big Bang. After the Big Bang. 13.7 billion years ago. It's staggering. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. A baby yeah. picture yeah. of the infant universe, the uh -huh. shock wave. You can see the gases coming out of the original shock wave. Yeah, I don't know if we can, maybe we can try because let's see if I can't find that picture. It's just right here at the beginning. And this is, maybe if you can just give them a little time to come focus in on this little map down here. Maybe you can explain what that is. And this is the picture yeah, of this the is, universe. This is now, the night sky. Come in sky. tight on that if you can, Gloria. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. This is the night sky, and the hazy thing you see in the front is just because of the optics of the way the galaxy is constructed. Yeah. So remove that. But here you actually see the shock wave. This is the actual explosion of the Big Bang itself, a baby picture of the infant universe showing the explosion that took place 13.7 billion years ago. Yeah, and this picture is three, only 300 and 70,000 years after that event? That's right. That's and staggering. That's staggering. getting right back to the beginning. Near the beginning of time. It's like a baby that's about an hour old, basically. Yeah, right. And some people, of course, don't believe in the Big Bang, but we scientists have photographed it. Isn't it coming to be generally recognized that the Big Bang is sort of part of the standard understanding of things now? Well, I would hope so, but there are some fundamentalists who don't believe in evolution and uh -huh. don't believe in the Big Bang theory and oh. actually try to get school boards not to teach evolution oh, the and creationism not to teach the Stuff and right. Yeah. However, you know, even the Pope, even yeah. the Pope said that Genesis is compatible with the Bible. And now even Buddhists can say that this theory is compatible with their picture because we do believe that this bubble is expanding in a higher dimension. Mm -hmm. Now, if we get the second slide, mm -hmm. uh, the second slide okay, shows my earlier this book. This is part of a PowerPoint projection. Let's bring up that second slide then if we can. Yeah. Right. The second, boy, uh, second slide shows my book, Hyperspace. That's hyperspace. We spoke about that a couple years back. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, where right. actually you see a cube hovering in midair. Uh -huh. That cube is a, a hypercube. It can uh -huh. only exist in four dimensions. Uh -huh. If you stick your hand in that cube, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, you find out that it's executing motions that are impossible in three dimensions. Huh. Only in four dimensions can that cube actually exist. Uh -huh. And that's why I wrote the book Hyperspace to show you that we physicists no longer believe in a three-dimensional universe. Okay. All right. Now, to visualize this, flat. Yeah. Yeah. to visualize this, um, well, I grew up in San Francisco area yeah. where mm -hmm. there was a Japanese tea garden. Mm -hmm. And in the tea garden, I used to look at the fish swimming just beneath the lily pads in a very shallow pond. Yeah. And I used to wonder, what would it be like to be a fish in mm -hmm. two dimensions? Mm -hmm. They could swim forward, backwards, left mm -hmm. and right. Mm -hmm. But the concept of up, yeah. up into hyperspace, uh -huh. up into the third dimension made no sense to the fish. And then I imagined that there was a scientist in, in there. Yeah. And the scientist would say, bah, humbug. Uh -huh. Anytime someone said there's a world beyond the pond, mm -hmm. that there are other ponds, yeah. that there are beings beyond the pond. Anyone can see there isn't any but this pond. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. The universe is the pond. Uh -huh. And then I imagine as a child grabbing the scientist, uh -huh. lifting the fish mm -hmm. into hyperspace, the mm -hmm. third dimension, mm -hmm. where the fish would see beings move without fins, mm -hmm. that is us, yeah. beings breathing without water, that is us, Mm. and moving with, I mean, moving with 
between other ponds. Mm -hmm. Now, today we physicists it believe... It would mess up their sense of reality, wouldn't it? Yeah, their whole conception <laughs> of what really yeah. exists, yeah. that there are multi-ponds out there, yeah. would really freak them out. Uh -huh. Now, today we physicists believe that we are the fish. Mm -hmm. We spend all our life in our pond, mm -hmm. called this soap bubble of ours. We move forward, backward, left, right, up, down. This is the universe as we think this of it? This is the universe as we see it, uh -huh. the universe as we can measure with our instruments. Oh, right. However, we physicists believe that there is a world beyond our sensors, mm -hmm. worlds beyond what we can measure. Parallel worlds, parallel, parallel worlds, universes. Parallel worlds, parallel universes. Right. And we are now spending, get this, yes. millions of dollars mm -hmm. at the most advanced university centers around the world mm -hmm. to test the presence test for the presence of these parallel universes. Uh -huh. Now, for example, think now, of... That, that's beginning to be accepted, whereas not just a very short period of time ago, that would have been thought of as uh, outlandishly mythic. Five years right? ago, people yeah. would snicker, perhaps, when At you talked about measuring the presence of an alternate universe. You had some of that problem when you put out a hyperspace? Well, the hyperspace yeah. talked about string theory yeah. when the theory was not popular. Yeah. My book broke it open. Mm -hmm. Now we have PBS specials on string theory. Yeah. We have full-page New York Times articles on string theory. Yeah. My book, Hyperspace, was the first major book to introduce the American public, in fact the people of the world, mm. to what we physicists are working on. You we will reveal this reality, won't you, and mess up our, our, our understanding. It's like we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the special theory of relativity in this year, 19, uh, 2005, are we not? That's right. So he had to go and write theory of relativity and bring up all these things that just upsets everything. Well, it takes us beyond Einstein. Uh -huh. Einstein gave us this picture of the expanding soap bubble. Yeah. And now we're going beyond Einstein, mm -hmm. visualizing other soap bubbles living in 11-dimensional hyperspace. Okay, now that's as uh, that's uh, beyond Einstein, that sort of thing. This is something that humanity is going to have to be catching up with these new realities, and there's still a lot to be done. That's right, and we're going to measure the, for the presence of these parallel worlds very soon. Uh -huh. In 2011, six years from now, that's NASA, not long. Yeah. NASA's going to launch in six years' time the most advanced gravity wave detector ever conceived of. What is a gravity wave detector? Well, it's three satellites orbiting the sun. Yeah connected by laser beams, making an equilateral triangle. Uh -huh. The triangle is three million miles across. Wow. It is the largest three satellite million. system. Yeah. Three million miles. Uh -huh. Much bigger than the Earth. Wait, it's orbiting the sun. It will orbit the sun in, in 2011. Synchronous, in synchronicity with the Earth? Or how That's right. Yeah. It, the Earth and Lisa will be orbiting around the sun. Uh -huh. And any shock wave from the Big Bang, the instant of the Big They'll Bang... They'll be able to go back before 370... Uh, to the years? instant of creation Wait itself. a minute. Now, you had, an, you had an analogy in there that if you were at the top of the Empire State Building, you look down through time, what is it? The 10th floor would represent, I don't know, some... Uh, distant galaxy. Distant galaxy when we got there. And then the, the thing that the WAMP, is that what it's called? WMAP. WMAP. WMAP would have been the, for the quarter of an inch or right. something. Now we're talking about... Empire State. Now right. you're talking about going right down below that. Right to the very instant of creation itself. This is millisecond? why uh, mm -hmm. we're talking about a trillionth of a second trillionth after the Big second. Bang. Uh -huh. This is why Lisa is creating such tremendous excitement in the physics world that mm -hmm. for the first time now, uh -huh. we can begin to visualize the baby universe coming out of the womb, right. the instant it comes out of the womb. Right. And we do believe that there may be an umbilical cord. Uh -huh. An Back, umbilical cord. All right, through, the, through these other parallel universes? That's right. That now, sort of in, in the third yeah. slide, yeah. okay, in the third slide. Okay, let's bring up the third slide, yeah. In the third slide, you'll see what we physicists think could be a baby universe. Okay. Now, we think of universes being there. huge now, and gigantic. That's the third gigantic, slide right. that we're seeing now? That's a baby universe. So uh -huh. if, if we had enough energy to to play with the energy of the Big Bang, uh -huh. we could actually create a bubble like this in our universe. It would be a bubbled universe. If you stick your hand, if you stuck your hand through the bubble, mm -hmm. it would wind up on another galaxy. Mm -hmm. So we physicists believe that this is how our universe was created. Another galaxy, another universe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, how do these umbilical cords form between baby universes and parent universes? Baby universe, if I may, go back up and, and bear with me a little bit here. The baby universe, you're going to go back with LISA, is that the name, the acronym for the telescope that's going to be 11 to 5 years, 6 years from now? 6 years from now, And it's right. going to give us a, qu a trillionth of a second look at the image. Big Bang image of that. And that's, in a certain sense, like a singularity in the creation of this universe that we've been accustomed to assuming is the whole of 
what exists. Right. We'll, we'll get the shock wave from the universe when the universe was smaller than a penny. The universe, of course, was smaller than an atom. This universe. Back then. Our universe. And, there, and, and what we hope to detect the presence of an umbilical cord. And this, this coordinates with superstring or string theory that unites unified field theory and, uh, and quantum mechanics That's in a right. way that includes gravity That's and right. is very satisfying in terms of a theory, in terms of understanding the structure of things in a very large, right. comprehensive way. You is see, that correct? That's like? right, okay. exactly. Well, you see, uh, Einstein's big theory... Big time stuff. Yeah, this is huge. <laughs> this is big. We're talking about reading the mind of God. Yeah, We're talking right. about the ultimate theory, the theory of all theory, the mother of, of all, all theories. theories. The right. mother of all theories. That's right. right. Now, remember that, mm -hmm. uh, that Einstein's theory breaks mm -hmm. down when the universe was very tiny. Mm -hmm. When the universe is smaller than an atom, Einstein's theory doesn't really say much at all. Mm -hmm. However, we do believe that you could actually trace the universe back even before the Big Bang using a higher theory called string theory. Uh -huh. Now, let me explain. Yes, please. Uh, we all know about black holes. We see them in science fiction movies. We photograph black holes. Yeah. They're gigantic. Uh, kitchen sinks in outer space. Yeah. They eat up stars, and we've actually photographed stars being eaten up by black holes uh -huh. with the Hubble Space Telescope. With the Hubble. Hubble. Now, the question is, where does all that matter go? If all that matter falls into the kitchen sink, into a black hole, where does it go? We believe it's blown out the other end. The other end being to another a universe? A white hole. A white hole. A white hole. A white oh, hole. Uh, do, do, do we have evidence of such within this universe, white In holes? our universe, uh -huh. we see no evidence of white holes. Uh -huh. We see black holes, but we think that our universe mm -hmm. is a white hole. Mm -hmm. You are living in one, we You're, think. Okay. So if you have a black hole, like a soap bubble, yeah. with a little pimple on it that then blows out and creates two soap bubbles, mm -hmm. it's connected by an umbilical cord. Right. That umbilical right. cord is called a wormhole. Uh -huh. It is a, a gateway right. connecting two universes. Mm -hmm. So think of two soap bubbles mm -hmm. being connected it at the hip mm -hmm. with a small little wormhole. Yeah. How One is the black hole. A wormhole? Uh, well, take a look at the ground, and if a worm burrows into the ground and comes out the other end, uh -huh. it connects two places uh -huh. of, of the earth. I see. Right. It's like uh -huh. a, a shortcut, a tunnel to the earth. Right, right. Uh -huh. So we believe that uh, we think that baby universes may sprout from parent universes. Okay, and that the 13.7 billion years of this universe was a singularity event as far as we are concerned, but it could be related to higher levels of uh, it, we could parallel universes that exist. And the string theory seems to, in a, in a mathematical and theoretical sense, nicely harbin be a harbinger of that possibility that might be uh, demonstrated to us in the time ahead? That's right. So okay. we need now a mathematics, uh -huh. a mathematics that works for that wormhole, that gateway, that looking glass uh -huh. that connects these two worlds. Right. That theory, we think, is string theory. Yeah, right. Now let me explain it's about It's relatively string. new. Uh, yeah, it's relatively mm. new. And string theory says that the vibrations of a small rubber band correspond to the different particles of the universe. So an electron would correspond to C sharp. Uh -huh. uh, a proton might correspond to D. Uh, G may correspond to a neutrino. Mm -hmm. And by vibrating the string, it can turn into any subatomic particle. You were doing A, G, C? You, you, that was like uh, DNA. Uh, well, or no, that's not. We're, uh, we're talking about the letters from A through G. Oh, I see. I, I, was, I, was, thinking rather, I was thinking of the the, uh, the uh, DNA. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. So we're talking about or musical genome, notes yeah. being uh, the vibrations of a string. So chemistry would be the laws of the melodies, the melodies you can play on strings. Physics would be the laws of harmony that you can play on strings. And then the universe would be a symphony of these strings. Mm -hmm. And the mind of God that Einstein wrote about in his memoirs no. would be... The same one that didn't play dice with uh, the same universe? Same God. Yeah. The mind of God yeah. would be cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace. Oh, 11, not 10? Uh, well, strings can vibrate in 10 dimensions. Mm -hmm. Membranes can vibrate in 11 dimensions. Uh -huh. And we do think that our universe is a membrane, a uh -huh. soap bubble of some sort. Uh -huh. And when it vibrates, it vibrates in 11 dimensions. Mm -hmm. That's pretty staggering stuff to try and encompass. Uh, 
Uh, I think the Catholic Church just let Galileo off the hook about five years ago for having come up with the, the notion it took of took him long enough. It took a, it took a while, you yeah, know, because what, people tend to be... years or so? Yeah, something like that. It wasn't it just a few, 10 years ago, so they, they said that uh, that's going to be... So this is... You're, you're introducing a thing that is introducing a new element in terms of understanding. Do you think you're going to have a hard time in terms of people who are lagging behind and trying to see things within our normal pattern, they're going to have a hard time accepting this kind of new theory that is sort of uh, blowing in the wind, as Bobby Dylan used to say, about things sociological? Well, this has philosophical, theological, and moral implications right. if there really is a multiverse. Yeah. First of all, the question is, do we exist in these other universes? Do Are there clones of us in these other universes? We being this biological entity. Now, most of these universes, we think, are, are dead universes. Uh, uh, when uh, you work out the solutions of string theory, you find out protons are not stable, atoms are not stable, stars do not ignite. So most of these universes are dead universes. However, some of these universes could look very close to ours. Some of these universes could be separated from our universe by just one quantum event. One quantum event, like now a butterfly flow can play. Smaller than that, uh -huh. a cosmic ray. Uh -huh. Now, a single cosmic ray uh -huh. can go through uh, a, a woman's womb. Like Hitler's mother? And Hitler's mother yeah. perhaps would have a stillbirth. Yeah. And in which case, in that universe, World War II never took place. Yes, indeed. Or yeah. perhaps a cosmic ray went through Roosevelt's mother, mm -hmm. in which case we're speaking German today yes, right. on this radio show. <laughs> right, 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 right. I mean, you begin to yeah. realize this yeah. is staggering yeah. moral and philosophical and uh, theological implications. Yeah, you're dealing with physics, but we're talking about human being. Now, we're talking about a biological process which is taking place in this universe, in a physical universe and that sort of thing. It's interesting to me in a certain sense that, if I may, and I don't want to get digressed, but it's really fascinating, but I mean, you, you, you get to be where you've got 370,000 years from the beginning of Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, and we're now down, I don't know if there's any correlation or something, hum humanity or consciousness, the consciousness that's taking the measure of this all, Mm -hmm. against 13.7 billion years of a slow climb up from the ooze and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that Remarkable, it's about 200, it? it is, and we're getting back close to about 200,000 years when humanity first appeared. If the DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA is correct, we got about 200,000 years mm -hmm. that Homo sapien appeared. Right. I don't suppose there's any connection, but the fact that we'll get back to, you know, a, a correlation between our biological evolution of consciousness and the ability to take the measure of this thing and the actual physical events that we're able to measure. Is there any point in trying to think of that or well, is there it are people who within that? There are physicists who actually try to build a philosophy around that. Yeah. Uh, given the fact that it seems quite remarkable yeah. that our universe is so hospitable to life, yeah. uh, we are just right uh, with regards to the strength of the nuclear force, the strength of the electromagnetic force to have life. Goldilocks. Goldilocks zone. <laughs> yes. Uh, if the universe yeah. uh, had gravity <coughs> a little bit stronger than ours, yeah. the universe would have imploded billions right. of years ago. Right. If the nuclear force were stronger, mm -hmm. stars would have burnt out right. and life would never have gotten started. Right. And there are hundreds, there are hundreds of these accidents that just make possible you and me. Yeah. Sitting here thinking, taking the measure of the whole thing. Right. So this is called the anthropic principle. Uh, it's one right. of the strangest principles of all physics, right. but it does say that it does look like the universe was fine-tuned, uh -huh. fine-tuned uh -huh. to allow for intelligent this universe, life. This universe. Our universe. Our universe. Now, yeah. there are two ways you can look at it, yeah. even in the physics there's world. There's fun stuff to think about, isn't it? Yeah. One yeah. way to look at it is there's a God, yeah. that this proves the existence of God, well, and there are physicists who actually state it flatly, that this proves the existence of God. Is there a big now, difference between the creationists and the intelligent design people, Pe Behe and that kind of stuff, or is that beside the point? Uh, well, the question is, if the universe is designed, then it's designed just right to have the nuclear force give birth to the sun, DNA give birth to molecule, I mean, give birth to, to cells, and, and eventually give birth to people. So it does seem as if it's a fortuitous accident. Is there but, you see, yeah. but you see, if you have yeah. a multiverse, yeah, yeah, if you have yeah, a multiverse, yeah, you've got other worlds to go to, then right? There are dead we worlds. We just get this universe figured out, you're going to bring a bunch more. That's right. Right. Then there are dead yeah. worlds, yeah. and so it yeah. means that you don't necessarily have to have a god. Yeah. It doesn't mean that 
There are universes where stars uh, do burn out very uh, fast. Uh, DNA uh, never gets off the ground. Right. Atoms are not stable. Right. We just happen to live in the universe which is hospitable to life. And Otherwise, happened. we wouldn't be here talking about right, it. Right, right. We wouldn't be here, and here we are. And people are worrying, are, are, are worrying about, or thinking about this idea. Is there, what's it all about, Alfie? What's the world about? Is in there fact, any purpose? That, that question sort of thing? comes back again yeah. because, as Charles Darwin mentioned 150 years ago, yeah. The laws of physics do seem to mandate uh, the death of all intelligent life in the universe the by the second, second law, law of thermodynamics. thermodynamics yeah. Right. Yeah. The universe is rusting. The universe mm. is running down, mm. running out of time. Mm. And the WMAP satellite has mm. confirmed it. Yeah. The universe is dying. Mm -hmm. This is the other great shock coming from the WMAP satellite. Mm -hmm. Our universe is expanding out of control. Yeah. It yeah. will eventually be blown apart uh -huh. by dark energy, which is blowing the universe apart, pushing the galaxies apart. Isn't it? Yeah. And it does mean that, as Charles Darwin said 150 mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. it's all for nothing. Yeah, it's, it's all, all in the end. It's like Lord Cain said, in the end, we're all dead. You know, our descendants all, yeah. uh, will peter out when Bucky, the universe Bucky Fuller used to posit that the biological evolutionary process was a counter, uh, anti-entropic syntropy. He called it synergistic anti-entropic function of the universe. Until you hit absolute zero or near right. absolute zero. Uh -huh. Now, in my yeah. book, Parallel Worlds, yeah. I mentioned that there's only one escape clause to the death warrant. Mm -hmm. The death warrant seems to be mandated by the laws of physics. Uh, However, physics, there, uh, is a, yeah. there is a loophole, yeah. a, an escape clause uh -huh. in this death warrant. Uh -huh. And that is that when it gets so cold that all intelligent life will eventually die when the stars blink out and the oceans freeze over. That's trillions of years. Uh, well, billions of trillions of trillions, years yeah. from now. However, yeah. we may be able to build a machine to go to, to a wormhole, the, uh, to, leave to a the new universe. universe. That's right. Ah, really? That's right. That's something that is uh, that your work and Mr. Um, Green up at Columbia is involved in this. I right? give a blueprint yeah. in the last chapters of my book. Yeah. I give a blueprint mm -hmm. for a machine. Mm -hmm. It's of course an incredible machine, mm -hmm. a machine that we cannot assemble with our puny technology uh -huh. that will allow us to boil space. Boil space. Now let yeah. me no, ex let me Please explain. Please do explain. It if takes you, a little explaining. If you heat water up, yeah. bubbles begin to form. Absolutely. I've seen it happen all the time. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> called boiling water, right? <laughs> e yeah. Yeah. Even us, even people like us can yeah. boil water. Yeah. If you boil empty space, right. nothing happens uh -huh. until you reach the Planck temperature. Yeah, That's well, 10 to the 42 degrees Kelvin. Holy that is an one. incredible temperature. Yeah. Space and time become unstable yeah. at the Planck temperature. Okay. Bubbles begin to form. Right. And these bubbles are, in fact, gateways. Mm -hmm. They are wormholes. They are looking glasses by which intelligent beings in the distant future may leave the universe and escape to a parallel universe. Through a wormhole. Now, calculations show that these wormholes may be very small, mm -hmm. in which case I advocate that any intelligent being creates an army of nanobots. Uh, nanobot. We're getting into nanotechnology? Nanotechnology, mm -hmm. molecular-sized robots uh -huh. that we will shoot through the microscopic it's wormholes. It's coming. It's coming. Carbon-60. Isn't, isn't that going to be... Machines made out uh, of atoms. Yeah. And we'll shoot these robots through the wormhole, which will then reassemble themselves on the other side, sure. create a factory. Instantiate, in the words of... Uh, and create a cloning factory. Yeah, right, right. Uh, there'll be like instantiation that Kur Kurzweil talks about, instantiating consciousness. And then these beings would, mm -hmm. as Kurzweil said, mm -hmm. have the ability to absorb information mm -hmm. to recreate their personalities, memories. Mm -hmm. And the race of beings that created these nanobots will have died. Mm -hmm. But the nanobots will take their personalities, their mm -hmm. memories, through yeah. the wormhole. Their consciousness. Their consciousness. Uh -huh. Reconstruct them uh -huh. on the other side uh -huh. of the wormhole. And the civilizations will flourish even if their temporal bodies have already frozen solid in the dead universe, they will live again. And you, and you say it has to get nanobot because the wormholes are so small? Does that come out of the theoretical understanding? Why isn't a wormhole big enough to handle me? Oh, well, we've tried to <laughs> look at large wormholes that yeah. will stabilize people. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. they may be possible, but technically they're going to be very difficult to create. That's we depend upon carbon-60. Well, that's why, if it turns out yeah. that these wormholes are microscopic in size, yeah. it doesn't mean that life has to end no. when the universe ends. Mm. It means that we may be able to regenerate life on the other side yeah. by shooting molecular, molecular robots. Yeah, but we that. had to get to the point where we could create molecular computing capability, and we're getting which to that is going through a process quickly. of 200,000 years of our being here, and we get to the point where we can start reading it, and we get the way that is an escape clause out of here by our technological development and our knowledge. That's right. So in other words, our technology... So that may be an anti-entropic function in terms of... Uh, 
universe. Yeah, in principle, entropy, the law of entropy, mm. may be reversed mm. if we look at the entropy between two universes. Mm -hmm. The entropy of one universe may be at a maximum because it's at absolute zero, it's yeah. a dead, frozen universe. However, the second universe may be young. Uh -huh. And we may be able to leave one universe. You can, they're, they're not, they're not uh, in the same time frame? These universes that exist are not connected in terms of we if, you, if you take a bunch of bubbles <laughs> in, a, in a bunch of uh, ivory soap and you make bubbles, they're all part of the same. But time That exists. larger context is of the same context, and so the entropy would be operative in all of them, or is that not the case? Well, I don't understand superstring theory. You see, um, each soap bubble may have its own clock, a clock on each soap bubble. Between clocks, there may be no time. Mm. We are talking about a world mm. beyond time. Yeah. Now, again, this raises mm. a theological question. Yeah. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas yeah. asked the question, mm. is God bound by time? Does mm. God have to say, oh my God, mm. oh my me. Like it's, me. It's yeah. four o'clock. Yeah, right. I have to rush to the <laughs> <Yeah>. other galaxy. <laughs> I'm late, I'm late, I'm late. For Does God have to do date. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas said, obviously not. No. God is beyond Omnipian. time. Yeah, yeah. He oh. is not just omniscient, omnipresent. Yeah. Yeah omnipotent, but he's beyond time. Right. Now that idea never got anywhere because there was no way to conceive of a world beyond time, right. except now. Uh -huh. Now we realize that if each soap bubble has a clock, uh -huh. then what exists between clocks? Uh -huh. And the answer is no time. Uh -huh. There is no time between clocks. Wait a minute, between the universe you have this umbilical wormhole. A wormhole, but off the wormhole, uh -huh. drifting in hyperspace. How about that being, that, wor that, that umbilical being some sort of a vibration I mean, a vibration. When you say vibration, it's usually a, a, a vibratory state is between two events. There's two events. There's a, there's a vibration between two maximally engaged systems, or that sort of thing. So it's a vibration rather than a. Yeah. Well, see, these soap bubbles are vibrating, and that's. We may be coming to a new relationship in terms of our understanding of our role in the universe. Well, that's after the whole 200, point. After two hundred thousand years of our that's evolution. That's the whole point of the book. Okay. The point of the book is that our role in the universe yeah. is not to simply burn out like a, like a cinder. Good. That is perhaps to explore the universe, and even when the universe dies, perhaps even to survive the death of the universe itself. Well, it brings it back to the idea, if I may, go back to Bucky Fuller, and he, he said, he looked about, he cast about, as he said. So we have the second law, and he cast about, and he said, is there any countervailing function in your and he said the whole biological evolutionary process on this planet was a anti-entropic evolu uh, an anti-entropic synergetic anti-entropic function that is uh, to bring conscious uh, uh, conscious understanding of the process of which we are a part there is a purpose to our existence it biology and human intelligence there's a purpose to it it's not all just chance and necessity and that's well if you take a look at the larger universe now and uh, then in our role in the larger universe right. now uh, are you talking about parallel universe or the well, larger just, universe just within our, our universe well, that's and big enough, when yeah. we'll be able to attain the ability to go between universes right we physicists rank civilizations and consciousness in three types Carl Sagan uh, type, did that too, type didn't one he? type two type three right. Carl Sagan also did that yeah we're type zero okay but we're about 100 years from being type one, which is a planetary civilization that controls every single planetary energy source. The weather, uh, hurricanes, volcanoes. Type one civilizations play with earthquakes. They play with hurricanes. And we're zero, and we've we're been zero, zero through all of our existence and all of biological That's evolution. Right. And but we're, we're 100 years, zero. we're still zero. Oh. Now type two is stellar. Not even a little bit above zero? Uh, well, I mean, technically speaking, one tenth, one Carl Sagan uh, said now? maybe we're I mean, point we made seven. a little problem, point seven. Now, well, type well. two civilizations mm. would be stellar. Uh, mm. They would have the ability to control stars. They mm. play with solar flares. Mm -hmm. uh, Star Trek, for example, the Federation of Planets on Star Trek would be a type two civilization. Mm -hmm. Type three is galactic. Mm -hmm. uh, they would control the space lanes of the galaxy itself. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you are type three, it means that consciousness has now spread throughout an entire galaxy. Uh, consciousness. Conscious beings uh -huh. would have spread throughout right. the entire galaxy. Right. Uh -huh. In which case, you may have enough energy to open up gateways to other universes. I see. This is, the call, this is called the Planck energy. Uh -huh. The Planck energy is 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. Wait a minute, you're going very fast. You had something about temperature that was Planck something. Is that, that temperature corresponds to the energy mm -hmm. uh, in terms mm -hmm. of billion electron volts is right. 10 to the 19 mm -hmm. billion electron volts. 
-hmm. In terms of degree Kelvin, it's about mm -hmm. 10 to the 42 degrees Kelvin. 10 to the 42. Can 10 to the 42 degrees Kelvin, uh -huh. or 10 to the 19 billion electron volts. Uh -huh. That is the temperature of the Big Bang. Uh -huh. That is the temperature Staggling. at which space and time become unstable. Uh -huh. Einstein's equations break down, uh -huh. and we have to go to a higher theory, mm -hmm. the quantum theory and string theory. You think, st is, is it, what, do, do, does string theory subsume? Einstein's relatively in the lowest field? vibration of the string is Einstein's theory. Mm -hmm. The entirety of Einstein's theory can be summarized as the lowest vibration of the string. Mm -hmm. And in two years' time, the yeah, largest now you mean from when we're talking in 2007 now yes. the largest mm -hmm. atom smasher in the world will be turned on. An accelerator where Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva, Switzerland. Geneva. It Near is so CERN? in the or CERN. Yes, yeah, it is CERN, so yeah, big. Uh, that you could put the entire city of Geneva inside the atom smasher. Oh boy. That's how big this atom smasher is. Is the financing is. there for that now? It's in place? The euro. Uh, the <laughs> euro is getting better That's and right. Stronger. About 10 billion euros are financing the Large Hadron Collider. And it's on course now. It's going to be completed in two years. And no. we hope to pick up echoes from the 11th dimension from that machine. From the 11th dimension. That's right. These are called sparticles. Uh -huh. Sparticles are super particles. They are the next octave of the super string. Uh -huh. the next octave. Uh -huh. So we are the lowest octave of the superstring. In terms of music, all the notes you see around us are nothing but the lowest octave. Mm -hmm. But of course there are higher octaves mm -hmm. and we hope that the Large Hadron Collider might be able to excite some of these higher octaves and essentially almost prove the correctness of, of string theory. You're, 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 you're assuming things like harmony, cosmic, the spheres, the music, the spheres, this kind of thing, and string theory. Wh why string? Uh, well, it's like the strings of a violin. Strings of a rubber oh. band. They're oh, very oh, strings of a what? Rubber band. Of a rubber band. Right. Okay. Yeah. When we probe into the nature of matter, yes. we smash atoms apart, yeah. we get protons and neutrons. Yeah. We smash protons and neutrons apart, mm -hmm. we get quarks. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what is a quark made mm -hmm. out of? Yeah. We do think that the quark is nothing but a, a musical note, mm -hmm. a vibration on a superstring. And if you look at all the musical notes that the string can vibrate in, you get the subatomic particles we see in nature. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of subatomic particles, mm -hmm. thousands of them. Mm -hmm. So many that in the 1950s, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the mm -hmm. father of the atomic bomb, wow. said that the Nobel Prize should go to the physicist who does not discover a new particle <laughs> this year. <laughs> we were drowning in subatomic particles yeah, uh -huh. in the 50s and 60s. Uh -huh. Now we simply say string. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And all these subatomic particles, in principle, may be cataloged as nothing but musical notes on a vibrating string. So uh, on a vibrating string, it has vibrating. There's a vibratory kind of quality to it. Right, and it also cannot move in four dimensions. It turns out the string is unstable in four dimensions. It can only move in ten and eleven-dimensional hyperspace. Uh huh. And that—that's something that we're just coming upon. And you say like five years ago, this was taken by with great. Uh, a great big a mountain of salt by a lot of people, but now it's coming to be accepted. They're not laughing anymore. They're not laughing anymore. Billions of dollars, uh -huh. billions of dollars are now going into proving aspects of this theory. Mm -hmm. Lisa goes up into orbit in six years. Oh. The Large Hadron Collider gets turned on in two years. And that's going to get us back to a trillionth of a second? Trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. Now, what will that do for us, if I may? Well, uh, if uh, that we get back to three, we've gotten out of where we got at 370,000 years after 13.7 billion years. Yeah. We get back that's to a shock wave that we photographed already. Yeah, right. But I mean, that's really something event, isn't it? That's I mean, the beginning of the universe. Yeah, it's right. almost 200,000 years ago from when we appeared. Right, and that's I mean, I don't know if there's a connection between that or not. Well, but we're it talking is about us perceiving these things. Yeah, we're talking about a baby picture of the infant universe mm -hmm. and. We will, with Lisa, have a pic picture of the universe as it emerges from the womb. And if we had a picture of consciousness and the evolution of consciousness, you're talking about in, in the, the universe being imbued with consciousness or something, we talk intelligent design. It was 200,000 years ago, if we could get a picture of 200, that would, we would have a picture of the emergence of a new reflective consciousness called Homo sapiens sapiens. 200,000 years ago. Well, and we're now maybe coming to a new relationship in terms of that evolutionary process of bringing a conscious pattern of understanding the process of which we're a part and which we've been ignorant of coming out of history. It could be. So a singularity is on the, on the horizon, a new kind of uh, development of a new 
a new condition such as uh, in the evolution of consciousness itself, maybe well, universal if, consciousness. If our universe did in fact come from a mother universe, mm -hmm. if our universe or itself if by chance is a white hole. If, if by chance and necessity these things just happen to coalesce in that kind of a thing, but it's a singularity that's on the horizon immediately. Well, if our universe is a white hole yeah. connected to a parent universe yeah. with a black hole, yeah. then it means that perhaps in that other universe, mm -hmm. perhaps it died. Perhaps they reached uh, the big freeze. Perhaps they reached their absolute zero. Uh -huh. In which case, perhaps a type 3 civilization mm -hmm. made it through the wormhole into our universe. Uh -huh. If that's true, mm -hmm. it means that there is, in some sense, consciousness um, everywhere Wouldn't because be of the fact yeah. that perhaps our universe did not materialize out of nothing. Uh -huh. Perhaps our, our universe came from a mother universe. Right, right. And that we're being tested in the sense because if we may, we have weapons now that we can destroy the whole species and cut off this whole proposition. The weapons well, that are there, they're, they're juggling mm -hmm. these atomic mm -hmm. bombs in the air now with preemptory things like that. And it could be we have, if we unleash the weapons of destruction as part of the scenario, apparently they tell us that we could wipe out the human, uh, the human species. Uh, that's Do you correct. think that's a true fact? Oh, definitely. Couldn't do it in the Second World War. Oh, definitely. We were protected in our impotence. When, when I was in high school, yes. uh, my mentor was Edward Teller. Oh, he was? You studied with That's him? That's right. Uh, yeah. He was my mentor in high school. He arranged for me to get a scholarship to Harvard. No kidding. And then when I graduated from Harvard, he made a very big pitch for me. You graduated from Harvard summa cum laude. That's right. Number one in my physics class. Congratulations. Number one in your physics class. That's you right. got a pretty good head on your show. Oh, thank you. Yes. And uh, then Edward Teller, uh, I interviewed with him. Yeah. He made a very big push for mm -hmm. me to go to Livermore or Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. To design that was before hydrogen the hydrogen warheads. bomb. Or was uh, this was after the hydrogen huh? bomb, but of course he had his own agenda, yeah. which was to develop third-generation hydrogen warheads. Star Wars, oh, basically, is uh, what he was thinking of. Uh -huh. And he got a lot of young scholarship winners to go to Los Alamos and Livermore to design the next generation of hydrogen warheads which are the foundation for the Star Wars program, for example. Uh -huh. uh, these are the X-ray lasers, uh, mm -hmm. hydrogen bombs orbiting mm -hmm. the Earth with the capability of shooting out X-ray beams, mm -hmm. which will then vaporize incoming uh, nose cones from mm -hmm. an enemy state. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there was, in fact, an ulterior motive behind the scholarship, yeah, yeah. which was to create a generation of Star Warriors. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's a book yeah. called Star Warriors really? about yeah. my scholarship, uh -huh, uh -huh. about the people uh, my age who were young, mm -hmm. very impressionable, right. and then recruited by Edward Teller uh -huh. to work on the Star Wars program. Uh -huh. And so we've arrived at a point where if their weapons were to be unleashed, unlike the bow and arrow and the rifle, if they were to be unleashed, we can, with some certain scientific understanding, a, a spasm of hatred or something, uh, it might well mean the end of the species. Oh, we could or definitely. Or is that, is that overstating it? Oh, we could create a nuclear winter without no, uh, any nuclear, doubt. Yeah. Well, there was some a question about whether, even if it was undone, nuclear winter, there would be somebody who would survive in New Guinea. Well, or the human species would survive. It would be ruination of civilization. But there would the human species survive because humanity, in terms of we're talking about consciousness, the evolution of consciousness, they have a self-reflective consciousness, and there's a. Uh, ability to take the measure of things that's pretty precious and we get to a point where we can destroy that it's a pretty uh, existentially significant moment in the evolution of consciousness and in the universe isn't no, it it's, it's the end of life yeah uh, no, the, end, not the end of life i don't think we can end life can we yes we could there are systems of uh, non photosynthesis of the smokers in the bottom of the ocean that would survive we could make the world radioactive enough uh, if in case of a war you think we could wipe out life yeah even the sulfur-based things that the smokers at the bottom of the ocean that don't right. photosynthesis, That's right. we could wipe that out too. If you make the world radioactive enough. Couldn't do that in the Second World War. Could not, could not. So we've, got, we've crossed some major transcendental, we've existential uh, moment in the evolution of consciousness. The transition from type zero to type one civilizations is the most dangerous but most historic of all transitions. Well, we may be closer to that type one than we thought. I mean, uh, you said before type one, you said uh, Sagan said point seven. Maybe we we're making some progress from zero. But yeah, we're but getting the point to a point where we're coming to where there's going to be a new, a significant transformation in terms of our relationship to the broader universe. Yeah, but you see, we still have the savagery that typified our rise from the swamp. Right except from we the have nuclear weapons. We've had a series of so singularities right through the whole evolutionary so process. So we may not make it to type one. Well, we may not at all. That's what Bucky used to say. We, it, it, it's touch and go. It's synergy. Synergy behavior systems unpredicted by the sum of the parts. And maybe we are meant to entropy and yeah. blow ourselves up and yeah. not make it. It's a shame. Uh, in terms of uh, as we get to this point where we can start taking the measure of it all. It's, 
an incredibly interesting time to be alive, isn't it? it? I think it's the most interesting of Can't all. Can't imagine any other time Because like we're this. witnessing the transition from type zero to type one. That's, that's the right. greatest of all transitions mm. in our history. Well, that's Just what think I, about it. Yes, the, and like, we, we have the privilege to be alive and participant in this. Yeah. It's so exciting, yeah. but For, it's also very hairy. Yeah, but the, the good language. aspects of it, take yeah. a look at the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the internet Isn't is a type one else? telephone system. Yeah. We're seeing the beginning of a type one telephone system. Yeah. English will be the language of a type one civilization. Uh -huh. And the European Union, NAFTA, we're beginning to see the beginning of a type one economy. Mm -hmm. Some people call it globalization. Mm -hmm. We physicists call it the transition to type one. Uh -huh. uh, there's, there's the beginning of a type one culture. Uh, youth culture, rock and roll, blue jeans, rap music. Uh, that culture has pretty much taken over the youth market it globally. Yeah. And so we're already beginning to see the beginning, just the beginning of a global civilization, mm -hmm. a planetary civilization. Uh -huh. And that's where we're headed for in about 100 years' time. You think 100 years? About 100 years' time. you think we got time. that long uh, well, to go along the course we're going now? Well, I think we have a 50-50 chance You don't think the universe is trying it. to tell us that we cross the line where we can, by our own hands and our own volition, we can destroy our species? That's not trying to tell us something well, in an I think, existential uh, sense? I think by mid-century, we, we could hit the point of no return with regards to global warming, You for mean example. by 2050? By 2050, in the next several decades, we're going to come very close to the point of no return. You don't, you don't see it uh, in the immediate sense. That we're, in immediate, uh, we're at a crucial crossroads now where we have things and uh, we're, we're, we, 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 it, the, the future requires a certain mindset or an understanding of things, and we're all caught up with historically inherited institutions and patterns that are... It's not uh, irreversible it's not yet. Added. We need a quantum sort of change in terms of our understanding of the of the of the historical patterns of which we're a part. We're coming out of history. James Joyce said history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awaken. We haven't awakened yet. You you don't sense that there's a an awakening that are you concerned about that? Oh definitely. The uh, not transition from type zero to type one is the most glorious, but it's also the most dangerous because we have biotech weapons. That's right. Designer germs. That's right. Uh, we have nuclear weapons. We have the greenhouse effect. Uh -huh. uh, any any one of them could potentially wipe out uh, life on Earth. And we have a capacity with the technological capability of providing for the citizens of the world, six billion heading for ten in a way that uh, we have not had traditionally the capability of providing, so that we could make the world, in a certain sense, liberated from the ancient scourges that have plagued mankind throughout this whole evolutionary climb up Mount Sisyphus. I mean, th th but we haven't arrived at that. We don't have a, a system of organization that involves all the humanity in a way like the 100 trillion cells of a human organism are united by DNA. We don't have a system that's in place that uh, effectively makes that kind of resonating whole of the human society evolved in a liberated context that might be relevant to what we need in order to get a residency with the higher order of things? Well, that's type one. You're talking about an overall, what I'm saying is an overall it may not organizing be, it scheme. It might not be 100 years off. It might be necessary that we get the pattern to that at a, low, at a level of political, pl economic, and social organization and so forth, involving all of humanity and all of the environment in a way so that we have a course toward that uh, if we're going to make it. Yeah, but I think uh, if you take a look at energy consumption of the yeah. planet Earth, okay. uh, and you get a you know, calculator to calculate when we will attain type 1 status, mm -hmm. it's about 100 years' time. We're laying, the ground, years, huh? we're laying the groundwork for it. Uh -huh. And you can see the beginning of it. Like I said, the Internet is the beginning of a type 1 telephone system. Okay. But by mid-century, uh -huh. the whole Earth is going to be tested very severely. It's being tested now. We are already That's seeing what the, I think is being tested break this up. week, I feel. It's, you know, yeah. We're already seeing the beginning of the break up the poles. Mm -hmm. uh, we're beginning to see the recession of every single glacier on the planet Earth. Yeah. We're beginning oh, to warming, see disruption yeah. of the global patterns. Yeah. The seasons are being disrupted on uh -huh. the Earth. Right. We're seeing the beginnings of it, yeah. and it's going to get awfully bad. Uh -huh. I personally think yeah. that there could be a disaster. It may take a global disaster before people wake up Wait to the real threat facing. Not, a, not on the order of a apocalyptic disaster where we unleash the weapons of destruction, some sort of a god of Ramadan I mean, disaster isn't about like the old days when it was a disaster over there, but this keeps going, the process. Disaster now, and a real disaster, I is uh, cataclysmic in a way that's never been the case. 
No, I think it may take a catastrophe before people wake up oh to boy. the threats of what's happening on the planet Earth. Yeah, but politicians aren't doing anything. That's what I'm saying. The leadership is absolutely quite. I mean, there's no there's no leadership that really sees the importance of the of. Uh, we don't have vision. We don't have a vision that is going to allow the system to be able to realize the importance of everybody and all the ecological content. We don't have that kind of a vision in terms of our political leadership, and they have control all of these weapons of mass destruction. That's right. That's why I'm saying we may not make it to Type 1 status. We may not. Bucky always used to say it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it would be a glo global era of Aquarius yeah, if we, we can negotiate all these uh, obstacles. That's the challenge, is it not? Yeah. That's the challenge of how we're going to get to that. And your book helps point directions toward that. And, and then the communication of this, and we have to have a raising of national, uh, we have a raising of consciousness and understanding That's of the That's why process. in outer space, yes. we don't make contact with other intelligent civilizations, probably because type zero civilizations are very cheap and plentiful, but they never And they all burn themselves one. out because That's they right. do destroy themselves. That's why we don't pick up signals out there. Well, we've made singularity things. Uh, 600 million years ago, we were all sponges. It was all sponges. All fauna was in the During sponge. the Cambrian era. Yeah. And so it comes up and it goes up like that. So it was like that. So we're at another time when there's a, but, but we're at a time of that. The averse side of the destructive scenario is a vision of a liberation that is going to liberate us from the context within which we've evolved. And that seems not to be on the horizon in terms of our our political or business or even our intellectual leadership now. And that's something that we would want to find in order to get some sort of a way in which we're going to avoid that cataclysm and open it up upon a liberating c potentiality that is the promise of the time in which we live. And that's what the human purpose is about now. Yeah, well, I tend and to think. Not 100 years off, I mean, I mean, like this week. Uh, well, you see the transitions taking place now, but mm -hmm. it's going to get more severe. All the trends that you see now are going to be magnified into the next several decades. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, it's going to be close. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us give us a 50-50 uh, chance that we'll make it to type 1 in, in 100 years' time. Mm -hmm. But you see, if we do make it to type 1, mm -hmm. you're talking about a planetary civilization, yeah. a civilization where people will have instantaneous access to unlimited amounts of information, where democracy <laughs> is going to be is going to be unstoppable. But why is that a hundred years off? We have the capability of doing that, having a pattern of that now. Yeah, but it's not going to happen. Who's why? going to pay for it? Because, because no we, don't have, well, we don't have an economic system that lets us do that's what right. we're capable of that's doing. So that's why a planetary economy. That's, that's why in a hundred years, that's why in a hundred years we will have a planetary why economy. Why don't we come up with that now? I mean, we come, why, why don't we come up with that now? There may be answers. Dreamers there. have yeah. always thought about why not tomorrow? Yeah. But the practical politics of it is, who's going to pay for it? Uh -huh. We're talking about the natural evolution of the economy, the natural evolution of energy production on the planet, no. which will naturally lead to type 1 civilization, because already you see trading blocks emerge, already no. you see the information being, being shared globally, instantaneously. All these trends will make a planetary civilization uh, regardless of, of any one nation saying, no, I don't want to be part of a type one civilization. Yeah, but we have a capability. Look, we have, it's an, ont we need new language, ontology. Ontology is a science of reality or understanding reality. So we have a new changed ontology from what we've emerged out of history, and that is that we can destroy the whole species. There's got to be an adverse side to that, the ontology. Bucky, one thing he put forth is we've transcended scarcity as an ontologic reality. We can make this world work. We know how to do it. It's not like an inflection point from 1905. We've got these capabilities. We have outmoded systems of organization, economic theory, political theory. But the politicians are not going to go for it. Well, that, what about the people and the intellectuals? Well, that's why the intellectuals and the people have to be fired up so that they well, force I'm the politicians. Well, I'm fired up. Aren't you fired up? And aren't yeah, a lot of people fired hey. up? But not a hundred years. Let's be realistic. Off. I don't Let's think we realistic. can think. We can't put it off to a hundred years from now. This thing's going to have to happen before that, don't you think? Well, I think implosion could take place uh, far, uh, way before a hundred years. Uh -huh. We're talking about, implosion. like I said, Is global that the warming. Catastrophe? Catastrophe, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. It could happen much before, uh, much sooner than 100 years. What I'm saying is the yeah. natural progression of the economy, the mathematics of energy production, would naturally create a uh, type 1 civilization in 100 years. Mm -hmm. But if the politicians don't do something, if the people aren't energized to force the politicians to do something, we, we may never reach 
we may, we may never reach but uh, there is i can't help thinking that there's a yin and the yang or something in the universe that we cross the line where we can destroy our whole species there is a side to that what would be the averse positive side to that kind of an altered ontology i can't help thinking at least one thing that would be worth putting on the walls of think tanks is we may have transcended scarcity in terms of a mater material scarcity in terms of the organization of this planet and that the ontology on a positive vein and that things could follow yeah, so that we could have systems that would let us do what we're capable of doing rather than struggling along on outmoded assumptions that the evolution of consciousness has transcended yeah but you forget one thing what is that as frederick Douglass once said <laughs> without struggle there's no progress yeah progress takes struggle the politicians are very comfortable the oil companies are very comfortable petrochemical is very comfortable they don't want to make a transition to solar technologies renewable technologies so well what's going to happen is we're mm -hmm. going to see global warming accelerate into well, the future well, I think we have a, I, I, I think there's something in that, in the communication of an alternative, and that if you're thinking about some of our alternative, you've got to have something that is going to present an alternative that's so comprehensively appropriate to the evolution of consciousness that it'll be liberating of the masses of mankind and ecology, but also so appropriate to the, uh, recognizing the inherited institutions out of which we come, and some people are at the pinnacle of, that in the end, there will be a leading indicator, but in the end, they'll be able to understand and go along with it as well. But that that, and it'll be in the realm of communications that these kind of things ought to be brought up by intellectuals and the general citizenry, and they, everyone who takes a, a course of, the, of action should read your book, mm -hmm. if I may say so. But I, I think it, that kind of thing, that challenge is before us now. I, I don't know, maybe I'm over. Well, maybe in a parallel universe. Uh, maybe in a parallel, <laughs> yes, well, yeah. But in my book, Parallel Worlds, you yeah. know, I do discuss the possibility that history may evolve differently in, in another parallel. universe, yeah. and perhaps they're wiser there. Perhaps they've already faced that catastrophe. Uh -huh. Perhaps they realize they have to rein in global warming. Uh -huh. They have to rein in nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, but in other parallel universes, perhaps they didn't, in which case they're not here to talk about it, All right. in which case they've self-destructed. And we may do the same. No. And it's it could be clear. that that's where we're met, but it could be that we have a higher calling, and that's what it seems to me your work is in, in calling us to. Mm -hmm. And I want to just thank you for viewing, and, and, and thank you for coming in very much. The book is called Parallel Worlds. You can't do better than get it. It's highly recommended. And Michio Kaku is the best voice I know in terms of trying to make the wonders of science and the human condition accessible to a wide audience. I thank you very much for that and congratulate you on all your work. Oh, my pleasure, really. Yeah, it's a great pleasure talking with you. I'm sorry we got carried away, but it's been a great pleasure talking with you and good luck on the, the book. I think it should be read by one and all. And thanks again very much for coming in. Okay. See you next time. See you tomorrow. Thank you for viewing and uh, it, it'd be interesting. We're gonna try and move to get in touch with some of these parallel worlds. It's a, it's a <laughs> brand new, it's a brand world out there. It's a very interesting time to be alive. So thank you for being, we'll come back tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't think, uh, Kurzweil's talking about singularity in 30, 30 years or something, or some sort of a Oh thing no, you see the- uh, But a hundred years. The hundred year timeline Yeah, is what is that? I mean, I can't think If nothing happens, years. if no disaster happens, if you simply take a look at the normal progression of energy, the normal progression of economic consolidation, it's about 100 years before you get a planetary civilization. However, yeah. it could be derailed very easily. It could be derailed, Nuclear but that war. would be a stillbirth. But how about a birth?